Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming back in for this, uh, the final session of this 2015 Cochrane UK and Ireland Annual Symposium. One of the things we've tried to do over the last three years since we sort of started this slightly a new, different style symposium is to give some of the senior leadership in the collaboration the chance to come and talk to us, but also not just to talk to us, but perhaps to bring along someone with them who comes from a different world from our own, but from a world from which we might learn. Now, um, I'm going to leave it to Julie to introduce our speaker. Julie Wood, I think you all, all know now, is the Communications Director from Cochrane. Um, so Julie, thank you very much for coming, and thank you for bringing your guest, and we look forward to hearing all about him and uh, hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Could you just, just put that on? Sarah, just put that oh, you know, thank sure. You. Thank you. Uh, Like that? Okay. All right. So hello, everyone. Um, for those of you who you will have, who were uh, a managing editor or were in the last session, there will be a few things that you may have already heard once, um, or maybe even two times. Um, but as I said in my last talk, um, and I'm going to borrow a, a joke that someone just made, people need to hear things uh, up to three to seven times to really take them in. So this is my effort to really make sure you're getting the information I really want you to hear. Um, so with, with that, I just wanted to kind of respond to some of the things that we've heard over the last day or so um, and just kind of update you as well in terms of what is Cochrane doing um, across communication? Uh, what are we doing? What do we hope to do more of over the next year? Um, so I started in Cochrane in September, so I'm fairly new. And actually, communications as a central, fun as a cent a central function of Cochrane um, has only been around for about a year. So this is um, very much kind of a new area in some ways as we look to really uh, make sure that our dissemination is going out more widely to make sure that our evidence reaches the people that it needs. So many of you, I'm hoping, will have noticed, especially in the symposium, it's nice to really see it being live and used, um, the new brand and logo um, that we've rolled out over this very recently over the last, um, well, see, it started in January, so that's just the last few months, and we're still in the middle of that pro process of getting all the... Um, groups branded up and pushed out, um, as well as in January, we also pushed, uh, have the new Cochrane.org, the newly rebranded Cochrane Library. Both those sites are up and running, but there's still much more work to do, and hopefully you'll continue to see that evolve um, over the year, as well as um, a branding up and changing and updating all the 120 other websites that Cochrane has. So it's taking up quite a lot of our time, centrally, to, to do that work and to support you all. Um, so thank you to everyone who's also helping us in, in, in achieving that moving forward. I also have um, some good news today. Cochrane, the Cochrane Collaboration um, Twitter fee feed um, has actually reached 40,000 subscribers as of this morning. So we're kind of all having a silent woohoo moment or, uh, for that. But really, I mean, that's just one, I think the more important thing to say about that is that, you know, I think social media is continuing to grow. Cochrane's across the entire collaboration is doing more and more um, on Twitter. And personally, many more of you are pushing out the evidence um, throughout social media. I just heard a great story of an author who had a, had a review that came out and he'd never been on Twitter before. But he, he thought, there's something in this that I really need to share. So he spent 20 minutes finding different groups um, and pushed out via Twitter. And it got picked up by um, an Amer uh, I believe it was American College of Physicians. I might have gotten the name of it wrong. Um, but very much just picked it up within 20 minutes and starting to use that. And then how that spread with just 20 minutes of work. So we're really starting to see social media uh, having a real impact in terms of um, driving forward and getting evidence to the right places. So that's great to see. Uh, and then uh, more and more blogs are happening, evidently Cochrane with their award, um, but also that's a real um, example of and what we're trying to get other parts of Cochrane throughout the world to think about more blogs as, this, as we become much more bi uh, multilingual. Uh, some, some languages are looking at evidently Cochrane blogs, they translate them, they push it out, um, and so it's just great that thanks to all the work that Sarah's putting in to make that possible. Um, and then press work. So we're doing much more in the media uh, to try to get out the really big reviews. Um, but very much linked to that, uh, what really, one thing I'm very aware of is not, we don't want to just 
do all this stuff centrally. We're, what we're doing is trying to do all this work to support all of you um, and very much trying to share best practice. There's so many amazing things that happen within Cochrane that we don't tell each other what we're doing, so we're not learning from that and um, using what's there. We all, we, so we're trying to do much more to have better internal communications. We just launched last, last month a communications network. So trying to get, there's about 70 people on that network. They tend to be translators, they're professional communicators, who, or people who have communications in their job at Cochrane. So trying to get them to share what are they doing, um, and also essentially showing them um, what we're doing, what's being tweeted out, what's working, what's not, and really trying to use that to drive forward our external communications by communicating better internally. But that's what we're working on. That's what we're trying to do to kind of move everyone forward and promote Cochrane. But really, I think, why does that matter to you? Why should you care? Um, one is just thinking about it purely from your own area of self-interest, of you're writing this review, you've put in a lot of work. Um, if you're thinking about, if you're an academic, how do you advance your career? Well, you have the ref. Using communicating out dissemination can help you with reach. Um, Rob, Mc, Rob McNeil, who I'll, who I will introduce in, in a little bit, can talk to you can talk to you about his views on the ref and how dissemination and media can help um, with that level of reach. Also, for many of you, your funders want to see your communicate your dissemination plans. So this is also in your self interest too. If you can show that your research is being used, um, it should help you get more funding later on as well. And more importantly, I think, you know, really thinking about how we improve patient care. How do we improve our patients' lives? You know, that's what we're all in this. And sometimes when the way we think about things and it's so complicated, some of the work that we do as Cochrane, we forget that. And so it's just to remember kind of why it's so important that everyone across Cochrane is really working so hard to do what they do. One thing um, I also wanted to comment on is some research that you may have seen it got picked up in the media over the last few months. It was a uh, story in the BMJ just about exaggeration within um, healthcare reporting. And I think it's very easy for all of us in Cochrane to say, oh, the media, they get it wrong. But actually, this research was showing that it's just as much university press offices who don't, aren't always so accurate in how they're describing that research because they're trying to get the reach um, without staying accurate to the actual research. And that's something that I think, as Cochrane, we have to work very hard to not fall into that same tra trap. So that's why whenever we're doing anything, we work very closely with the review group, with authors, to make sure that anything that we're doing is true to the research, is not over-hyping research, and also making sure we're doing things like thinking about what's the absolute effect instead of the relative effect, and making sure that how things will be you know, a press release can be as true as, as it absolutely accurate to the research, but what's the few nuggets that a journalist is going to pick out and making sure that those things are very, very accurate as well. Um, so again, it's just to kind of say that we're working on that. We're trying to develop some guidance as well to make sure that we're always following a few key things we need to make sure is in the press releases that we produce as Cochrane. I just wanted to talk through one example some of you may have heard about last week. We had an updated review come out. It was on school-based education programs for the prevention of sexual abuse. And the findings showed that pretty simply that if students were had education about sexual abuse, being aware of the dangers, how to identify it, they were much more likely to report it. Um, and that, we thought that was a very, very important message that needed to get out. It was very topical given everything that's gone on in the UK. Um, so we had a press release, press conference uh, last week um, and we found that press conferences really help in much more than just a press release. A press conference really helps in terms of the journalists understanding the research. Um, so what we did is we had um, David Tovey on the panel, the author, Carrie Ann Walsh, who happened to be over from Australia. So that was a lucky coincidence. So we could really support her in that. So that's also the reason why that worked. Um, and then we also had the co-ed from the group as well on the panel. So she, uh, she could kind of play a role to Geraldine McDonald, so she could play a role in explaining that research as well. Um, so we had the press conference, we explain the research, and then we answer questions. We, we, and we really think that helps 
kind of inform the media coverage that goes out because then the journalists can ask questions directly to the authors. What also happens is the journalists learn from each other in terms of are, am I interpreting the research as well. That story then gets posted by those journalists and then other journalists pick up the story as, as it moves around the world. So it drives much more accurate reporting. Um, and we've, we've found that really useful um, as a tool and it's something we'd like to do more of. But it is quite time consuming. So we've done about three in the last six months. Um, so we hope to be doing more and in other parts of the world, but that's just an update kind of on where that one is at. You can see some of the coverage, The Guardian, the BBC picked it up. BBC picked it up all over local radio um, and carried it everywhere. And you might think, well, it's local radio, but that's got a coverage of about 7 million people over the course of a week. So it actually does get an awful lot of coverage in the UK. We tweeted it. We did highlighted review. There was a podcast that came out at exactly the same time. Um, and then we also had this very, a very, very good piece in the Times Educational Supplement, which I think is important if you think about impact, because that's actually being read by people in education. There were also discussions um, making sure the report got to uh, UK, um, the correct UK d departments. Um, because of the, where things are at with the election, they really couldn't comment on it, but we actually we just want to make sure they had the piece. Um, and then we also... We made sure the NSPCC had it as well, so then they could comment. Because the NSPCC can go much further than Cochrane ever would, because we would stick to the evidence, whereas the NSPCC could talk about how this is so important and kind of push further, because it fits in with some of their campaigning aims as well. And then from an author perspective, we had this, um, Carrie Ann Walsh, as I said, was the author. You know, This was how she felt about uh, the whole thing, feeling very supported um, and feeling that it, we worked very hard to kind of make sure it was meeting her needs in terms of what was the impact we were trying to achieve. Um, and as well as then David um, Tovey, his views on this in terms of wanting to see us do more press releases, really reaching out. So I hope you'll be seeing more of that um, this year um, as we move forward. So in terms of moving forward, more media, we're also, my team is here to provide that central support to authors, um, as well as to review groups. And so it's been wonderful to be at the symposium to kind of get to meet more of you and really hear about the reviews that people are working on and some of the issues that they find um, as the team gets more embedded. Um, but with that, I really wanted you to have a chance to think about um, and, and hear another story of someone outside of the world that Cochrane is in. Um, so I've invited today Rob McNeil. He's a former colleague of mine from Oxfam, so we worked together very quite a long time ago. Rob's been a journalist for over 10 years, um, as well as working at WWF, uh, Conservation International, um, as well as now, and about the story he's going to tell you about, which is the Migration Observatory and how they approach uh, working with the media. So thank you very much, Rob. Hello. Um, so, do we have a... Ah, here we go. Brilliant. So, uh, I, as Julie has very, as rightly said, I'm Rob McNeil, and I work for a project called the Migration Observatory at, uh, at Oxford University. And, uh, and I specialise in doing sort of strategic media work for, for academia, really, now. Um, and so, my talk today is going to be uh, dealing with the work that I do for, for the Migration Observatory. Um, and... Uh, the way that the media deals with migration issues is obviously extremely topical at the moment. I'm sure many of you will have seen some of the rather dubious coverage that occurred last week um, after a piece that was run in The Sun by a woman called Katie Hopkins, which described, uh, described migrants as cockroaches and suggested that the best way to deal with those in the Mediterranean was to use gunboats and pelt them with beer cans. And that, while it's one of the most brazenly offensive articles that I've seen about this in, in the last few years, probably the most brazenly offensive article that I've seen about this ever, actually, um, is an anomaly. It's not really the kind of core of, uh, of, of how the media covers migration issues. So what I'm going to be talking about today um, is three things. Um, hang on, let me just make sure that I do this the right way around. Um, yes, here we go. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about three things. Um, first, first, which are a bit more related to the sort of the structural nature of how narratives emerge and what you can do about them. So the first thing I'm going to be talking to you about is what truth means in a media story about migration. And, and, and related to that, sort of what does media coverage about migration in the UK actually look like? Um, the second thing I'm going to be looking at is what motivates media organisations to report about issues in particular ways. And how does that relate to those first two points about truth and, and what the coverage looks like? 
And then thirdly, I'm going to be looking at uh, how one can work strategically to affect national narratives and deliver impact. So when Julie first approached me about doing this talk, I, I did wonder, I have to say, about what value I might be able to offer to people who do things like review clinical trials. But actually, I think that there might be some quite interesting parallels between what we do at the Migration Observatory and what Cochrane does, in that we're both independent bodies, uh, we're apolitical, and we're attempting to inform a very complex and often contentious debate by highlighting the very best available research. So I hope that some of the experiences that we've had in turning ourselves from what we were some time ago, an unknown organisation, uh, essentially a start-up uh, four years ago, into what the, what's now described by the Sunday Telegraph, I'm pleased to say, as the UK's most respected body on immigration issues, might be interesting. Um, so I'd also hope that some of the things that I talked to you about today might help you to develop some ways of increasing your overall impact generally for as individuals or as an organization and managing reputational risk which is a key thing to think about when dealing with the media and if not then they might at least give you some kind of an insight into the workings of the press that you might not have already considered so um let me just tell you quickly about the migration observatory um so our our, our objective as i think i explained already is to inform public debates um, we're in an independent and evidence-based way, which, again, it's not, not greatly removed, I think, from some of the things that Cochrane does. And we provide a huge suite of data and analysis and draw on expertise from around Oxford University to provide independent, politically and ideologically neutral evidence to help the UK to have a rational discussion about migration and the associated issues. And by this, what we mean is a debate which is less polarised and based more on evidence and less on assertion. But if we want to inform public debates, then we have to reach the public in places where the debates are taking place. And now, fundamentally, this means the media. And as Julie's already said, my background's in journalism, and I was a newspaper reporter for about 10 years, and, there, and, and more recently in strategic public relations. So I spend a lot of my time working to insert our analysis into pertinent media debates, um, which, with I mean, when you're dealing with an issue like migration, can be like opening a particularly large can of worms. So... The challenges that we face fundamentally stem from two very difficult words, truth and migration. And they're challenging because they're both actually rather vague concepts, um, but they're also extremely important. So let's start with truth in the context of news. I mean, the one thing that everybody wants from journalism, understandably, is truth. If you know or if you even believe that the, that the news source that you use knowingly misleads you, then what it presents you with stops becoming fact. It becomes fiction, and fiction is not news. It's either entertainment or else it's just a lie. But truth's also very subjective. The same information can mean different things to different people at different times and in different contexts. And truth can also be partial and, and misleading. I mean, a story comprised entirely of correct facts and quotes can ignore either deliberately or, or by mistake, other important facts that end up telling a story that leads the reader to conclusions that are fundamentally flawed. So paradoxically, as I say, truth can sometimes be misleading. So now let's talk about migration a little bit. I mean, migration is another difficult word, and it's difficult because it encompasses a vast array of different interlinked phenomena, none of which is clearly uh, explained by the word itself. It, you've got economic migrants, you've got refugees and asylum seekers, students, family members, people who migrate just because they fancy a change. You've got foreign criminals. In fact, everybody who moves from one country to another has their own story. Um, and everybody who encounters these people at a different point, whether it's at the beginning of their journey, while they're in transit, or at their, or their point of destination, is going to have a different experience of these people as well. And migration is also simultaneously a political issue, it's a social issue, it's an economic issue, a historical, a historical issue, it's a legal issue, an anthropological issue, geographical, demographic, and an international, demo, uh, an international development issue as well. So indeed, the very word migration, much like the people that it's used to describe, crosses boundaries and borders and creates, creates confusion and vexation. So to illustrate this, I'd like to have a look at what can happen to the truth um, about migration in newspaper stories. So I want to look at uh, a fairly recent uh, story which appeared in the news, um, which is the, the, the migrant crisis that occurred in Calais last year. And I want to start by just putting forward a few pretty much undisputed kind of facts. Okay, so the, over the course of last year, at various points in time, there were between about 1,500 and 2,500 migrants in Calais, 
uh, who were hoping to reach the UK by clandestine means, and this is generally speaking in the backs of trucks that they've broken into or what have you. Most of these people were from countries with poor human rights records, and these are country and countries encountering some level of instability. And these are countries that include Iraq, Syria, Eritrea, and Sudan. I mean, those are sort of four of the main countries of origin. Most of the people are not thought to have claimed asylum at the stage that, uh, at the, at the, at, well, well um, at any point prior to arriving in Calais. Um, and so, therefore, they don't actually have legal status. But most of them, well, certainly many of them, but probably most, are expected to claim asylum in the UK uh, if they can get there. Um, there were, and there still are, serious concerns in Calais about the impact that this is having on the town. And a large group of them, a few hundred, were filmed uh, trying to break onto a ferry in order to, uh, in order to try to get to the UK. Um, it's also fair to say that those migrants who are in Calais do consider the UK to be an attractive destination. And the mayor of Calais, a woman called Natasha Bouchard, was extremely critical of the UK, uh, suggesting that the welfare state in the country had created, was far too generous and had created what she described as an El Dorado for asylum seekers and, and irregular migrants. Uh, um, and so let's just look at what that media response to, to, to that looked like. So um, we've got uh, the Daily Express there saying, Britain is a migrant magnet. Um, our soft touch benefits system acts as a magnet, says the Daily Express. We've got the Metro saying, migrants are ready to die for your benefits. Mayor of Calais warns MPs of a growing crisis. We've got the Times saying, Calais goes to war on soft touch UK benefits. We've got the Daily Mail saying, Britain's an El Dorado for migrants. Um, Calais Mayor brain blames our generous welfare system for luring thousands to channel ports. And even the Guardian, you know, which tends to take a more sort of leftist and sort of more positive approach to migrant issues, uh, or to migration issues, rather, uh, says My Calais migrants willing to die to come to Britain, says French Mayor. Now, let's consider two different interpretations of the truth in this situation. So are these stories providing an accurate or truthful account of Natasha Bouchard's evidence to the UK government's Home Affairs Select Committee? Yes, they are, pretty much. They're reflecting what she said, that's fine. But then there's the other question. When you consider the overall narrative that's being provided to much of the UK, to, to the, much of the UK public through the media here, which is that Britain's welfare state is particularly generous to asylum seekers and that therefore the country is attracting a particularly large number who are willing to die to get to the UK, is that correct? Well, that's where it becomes a little bit more blurry. In fact, I would say that it's actually fundamentally not really correct to say that. So here are some points that the Migration Observatory made to inform the media debate at that point in time. So the first thing is, so Natasha Bouchard obviously is the mayor of a town in France. In 2013, France received 66,000 applications for asylum, while the UK received 29,000. Germany took 126,000 and Sweden took 56,000. So when you look at it in that context, the UK doesn't look to be particularly attractive. And in fact, actually per capita, because obviously these are absolute numbers, per capita, the UK ranks 16th out of 28 EU member states. Now, that's not to say that the issues facing Calais are not significant. They are, but they're localised. Calais is a bottleneck. It's a place through which those people who do want to come to the UK may well pass. But that isn't the same as those migrants being there being proof that the UK is a particularly at attractive destination to asylum seekers. Also, you've got another issue there, which is that the definitions are vague and confused. And that's a very important thing to consider. Are the people in Calais illegal immigrants or are they asylum seekers? Addressing terminology is really important with, for, for, with reporters, but it, it can be rather difficult. They, they often don't want you to pick them up on the way that they describe people, but seeking asylum isn't illegal. Um, and the UK is, I'm sure you all, you all know, the UK is committed to providing refuge for people fleeing conflict or persecution. So the, the terminology matters here. Then there's, there's another point as well, which is worth considering as well, which is something that these, that these pieces aren't covering, which is that these stories are actually ignoring the fact that these people are from, generally speaking, war-torn and highly unstable or repressive countries. And leaves you with the question, well, what should the UK or the French government do about them? And what should the response of the EU be? Now, this is, of course, all playing out all over again now, all too tragically in the Mediterranean. We've, we've seen repeated, repeated scenarios where people coming over from, on boats, generally from Libya, have been encountering awful, awful scenarios. But regardless, for all of those that have drowned in the Mediterranean, which is a huge number this year, an enormous number are also arriving in, in Italy. And so I think it's reasonable to say that a large number of those people are probably going to make their way up through, up through Europe and, and those that want to come to the UK are going to come to Calais. 
So we're going to have the same thing happening over again in 2015. But the overall point of this whole discussion so far is to point out that truth isn't always the same as helping people to understand a scenario properly. So the Calais example just gives us one specific new, an example of one specific news story. But public response to, to news isn't based on, on just single stories. It's based up on narratives that are built up over a long period of time and through numerous stories. And so to try to understand that, um, one of the things that we did at the Migration Observatory was to try to quantify things, to try to, to... And we designed a thing called the Migration in the Media Project, which is a sort of bit, a big data project of sorts, um, which took all newspaper stories in 20 national newspapers for a three-year period and took every single story which used the word, which used one of four target words, one, which were immigrant, migrant, asylum seeker, or refugee. Um, and it examined which words were used in association with those terms. So this was to try to get a, 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 an overall picture of the migration debate as a whole over a long period of time. And so, I mean, just to set this in context for you, we, we analysed more than 58,000 stories made up of 43 million words. Um, and so for the purposes of simplicity, we're, we're going to be looking at two of the two main types of words that we looked at. One was descriptors, or what we call L1 colicus. These are the words that appeared one word to the left of the target word. So uh, beautiful immigrants or exciting asylum seekers or whatever it may be. Um, and the other one was consistent colicus, so words that appeared regularly throughout the process of that, of that throughout that three-year period with that same word. So here is something, let me give you, let me show you what the key findings are, because I think that this is just a very, a very sort of tailored version of this. But the word that was most commonly associated with immigrants was, this is the, the descriptor, the L1 colicate that was most commonly used to, to describe immigrants was illegal. And that was across all newspaper types, so across tabloid newspapers, mid-markets, which if you don't know are newspapers like the, the Daily Mail and the Daily Express, and obviously in the, broad, in the broadsheets as well. And it, was, and it dominated by a, a huge margin. It was 10 times more likely to be used than any other descriptor. Um, now, and then consistent colicates, again, were dominated by the word illegal. Um, but in tabloids and mid-market newspapers in particular, they were all, it was also words that described the scale of migration. So it was words like a million, number, thousands, influx, that kind of thing, um, uh, along with words that related to the welfare state, like benefits, for example. Then when you look at asylum seekers, you see another, another fairly clear narrative coming out of the numbers, um, which is that the most common word associated with asylum seekers was the word failed. Um, <clears throat> as well as actually, again, illegal, which, uh, as we've described, I mean, you can't actually be an illegal asylum seeker. Um, uh, and the word criminals, in both, and that was in both the mid-market and the broadsheet newspapers. So from that, we can see that the most prominent narrative in the UK media around immigrants is one of illegality. And the most prominent narrative around asylum seekers is one of failure, suggesting a false claim. Now, you then have another question, which is, is this the wrong thing for the press to do? And that's a very subjective question. Um, I mean, if the British public's biggest concerns are about illegal immigration or people accessing the UK by clandestine means or whatever, or overstaying their visas or whatever it may be, that's one thing. If people's biggest concerns about asylum are people's fraudulent, people putting in fraudulent claims, again, it's perfectly reasonable that the media might respond to it in that way. But then there's another question which is associated with that, which is, well, is the reason that people are that the public is concerned about these things in the first place the media coverage of them? So there's a sort of complicated circular question there. So <clears throat> why does British newspaper reporting about migration actually look like this? I mean, I would say that there's a good, solid commercial reason for media organisations to tell, to tell stories in particular ways, regardless of whether those stories are misleading or partial. And that's that news organisations are generally speaking, they're commercial or quasi-commercial bodies, and news is not a service. It's a commodity. It's used to sell products, and different products use different types of news to sell to different markets. So most news organisations in the UK, terrestrial broadcasters aside, don't have a responsibility to be balanced in their coverage of any issue. They're businesses, they're not public servants, and their intention is to sell their content as effectively, effectively enough to keep the business functioning and to make a profit. So for a newspaper, what this actually means is understanding who buys your product and what they want, then giving it to them, and then building a relationship with that customer where they like and trust the content that you provide and keep coming back to you. 
And this kind of segmentation of the market means that if newspapers are selling their products to people who are likely to be broadly opposed to immigration, then they're not going to start challenging their readers' views. It would be, it would be crazy to do so. Instead, they're going to tell their readers what they want to hear, and they're going to help those readers to feel that those positions are justified and sensible. I mean, of course, it's never quite that simple, because in order to be trusted, you have to at least sort of make a cursory effort to present counter-arguments and, uh, <laughs> and shades of grey. Um, but like I said, it would be commercially absurd for, for a media organisation to start trying to represent or to start trying to push a point of view that was completely at odds with the views of its, of, of its readership on a regular basis anyway. And from this perspective, we can see that there's a basic business case for anti-immigration news content in the UK because repeated surveys for decades, including one undertaken by the Migration Observatory, which you can see up on the, on the, on the slide there, have shown that a significant majority of British people are concerned about levels of immigration. Um, so, I mean, like what you can see here is that actually 70, about 75% of the people that we surveyed showed, said that they would like to see re immigration reduced by either a lot or, or, or a little, um, mostly by a lot. So stories that dwell on the negative aspects of immigration are more likely to resonate with a larger group of readers than stories that push the positive ones. So here's the bottom line. Anti-immigration media outweighs the pro or at least non-anti-immigration media by a substantial margin because more British people are concerned about immigration, about levels of immigration than are not. So it makes business sense to capitalise on it. Now, I don't want to try and second guess what this means for an organisation like Cochrane, um, but it's not rocket science to surmise that a newspaper like the Daily Express, for example, which has a core audience of older people who are going to jump on a story about a wonder drug about that's going to save you from cancer or dementia or heart disease. Um, and, and the reason that it'll leap on those kind of stories is because it's going to appeal to their audience. Now, I mean, I would hope that the more that Cochrane becomes a household name with... The wider public, with a wider public understanding of the kind of work that you do, then the more that where these stories are not actually supported by evidence, you can add some context to the debate. And while this may not always result in change, you may well find that sometimes you can prevent bad science from hitting the front pages um, and, becoming a, and, and thus becoming essentially a part of this national narrative by simply being the trusted voice that says, you know what, we don't consider these findings to be robust. So, I mean, going back to the Migration Observatory for a moment, we face a challenge. We want a better, less polarised, more rational and more balanced media debate. We want rational evidence-based... Sorry, we want rational and evidence-based policy-making, and we want an informed public. But this can sometimes be at odds with the commercial motivations of the press. So how do you get around this? Well, my answer to that is that you need patience and you also need to think strategically. Um, <clears throat> so when we undertake media work, we, we use a strategy which is essentially what, I, what you, a strategy process, which is essentially what's laid out here. So please don't feel obliged to take notes. I'm sure you won't. Um, but, and while you obviously have to be clear about things like your aims and you have to understand the context in which you're operating so that you understand what's actually going to happen, what, 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 you know, what the actual situation is that you're trying to change, um, and you also have to have some key messages. And there's a lot to be said about all of the different phases in this. What I want to concentrate on today are the three, point, the three areas in the middle that I've, kind of, that I've put in bold. Um, and we'll get, I, want, I want to start by talking about analysing where power lies um, so that you can actually reach and influence an audience, the audience that you need to speak to. Now, I can only really talk from my own personal experience, so I don't want to start, again, trying to second-guess where the power lies for you guys to achieve change. But from our point of view, I, I, I would say that we start with the need, with a need to be engaging with, with politicians. We need to engage with them because we benefit from the authority that they... That, 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 sorry, they benefit, rather, from the authority that we can provide to them by being an independent, respected source of data and analysis. But we also benefit from the authority that they provide for us by being senior people, talk, you know, important people talking about how brilliant our work is. But also, obviously, they create policy. Um, and on top of that, they also drive the rhetoric that the, broader, that the broader public then encounters through the media or through whatever other source they're going to get things, generally the media. But then we have a problem as well with dealing with politicians, which is that if we work with one party or another in particular, uh, and they start, or if they just, even if they just start to use our materials more than one of the other parties, then it starts to, it runs the risk of colouring us with their ideology. So we do have to take care on that, on, on that front. 
Um, another group that we have that we that we try to work with closely, obviously, is civil servants, um, and working directly with them as well as as well as through through the broad process of kind of getting media work out to them, um, or getting them to see media work. And civil servants are easily as important in the policy making process, obviously, as politicians. They've got a far lower likelihood as well of damaging our reputation by misrepresenting our work in public. Um, and in fact, one of our greatest successes to date really has been developing a really good relationship with the House of Commons Library, which now regularly provides our work to MPs to inform them on key issues. Um, outside of that, we also have to work with civil society organisations and think tanks. So for, in our area, this is organisations like IPPR, uh, Migration Watch, the Migrants Rights Network, the Runnymede Trust and Demos. And these people are important because they frame national narratives. Um, they do so through their reports, through policy recommendations, and all through regular media interventions. Um, sometimes they just inform, and sometimes they actually succeed in making their points of view seem like the only way that an issue can be discussed. So just to give an example, I mean, if you look at Migration Watch, Migration Watch's focus on net migration about four or five years ago has now become the frame for the entire national debate on, migra on immigration in the UK. And so if we can create a situation where our data and analysis is it provides a kind of suite of materials which any organization whatever their ideological perspective can use and can and that where our data where our materials essentially become an agreed baseline for accuracy for all of them then we improve our standing and we, and we also help to ensure that they benefit from the authority that we can provide them but again another difficulty that we face in this situation is that some of these organizations actually have a vested interest in painting us as partial uh, because they want to occupy an expert space in the media and policy discussions in order to further the whatever whatever agenda it is that they're already, that they espouse so it's a complex area and then we also have to work directly with home affairs journalists now I would highlight the fact that work, that media coverage is not and should never be an end in itself. It's it's a tool to achieve your broader and more important aims. But from our point of view, I mean public and political perspectives on the issues that we're discussing are shaped by the stories that these particular set, this particular set of people produce. And so if they know us and if they trust us and if they believe in the work that we do, um, then that means that our story, that when our stories give their stories the authority that they need, then our messages reach millions of people over and over again. So it's an extremely important group. Um, I mean, one of the important things is that is, from our point of view is that we work with, with, with journalists from outlets that cover a range of political perspectives. I think I've made this point over and over again. I mean, in the same way that working with politicians or think tanks from one political hue or another um, can colour the way that you're perceived, you know, we have to do the same with, with media organisations. So I work very closely with media, with media organisations on all political sides. And then also we have to work with leading academics, you know, and we have to be trusted by leading academics because if your peers don't regard what you do as being of value, then obviously it won't be considered to be of value by the media, by politicians or anybody else because you'll be, you'll be discussed in negative terms by other people. Then the key media targets that you want to use. Now, again, I, I, don't, think there's, well, I don't think there's an awful lot of point in me kind of listing a suite of media targets that I use in different, uh, f that I have in different situations. But what I would say is that I spend probably more of my time trying to crack the less receptive markets the newspapers, in, in my situation, the newspapers which tend to write lots of very angry stories about migration and that are very sceptical about academic analysis if it doesn't just say that migration is a fundamentally bad thing. Um, <clears throat> but importantly, what, I, what we do when we're working with these, with these journalists is that we don't try to change their views. That's not what we're there for. We, tr we simply try to make sure that whatever they're, whatever they're doing, they're using the best available, uh, the best available information. Um, if the entire migration debate, pro and anti-immigration, is, is built on a clear understanding of the trade-offs associated with, with whatever policies are being espoused, then essentially we've done our job. And sometimes our analysis kills stories and makes them boring. Uh, it annoys the hell out of journalists when you do that. But the responsible ones will take it on the chin and they'll scrap the story. I mean, there is a situation which, where the irresponsible ones simply ignore what you've said to them and they print the story anyway, or even worse, they'll deliberately misrepresent what you've said. That's not something that you can always control. But that one scrapped story, that's a tangible win. You know, that's a demonstration that you've made a small step towards improving the debate, just as much as a great story which runs on the front page of something and shows you, and, and shows you in a positive light. Now, these are all incremental steps towards a better media debate. So, I mean, like, we can hardly claim that we've had achieved some gigantic victory. But what we can say is that the existence of an independent, politically neutral, authoritative body like ours and like yours 
um, which focuses, in our situation, one which focuses hard on the media, it does help to prevent the media debate from becoming more polarised and less evidence-based, and that's got to be a good thing. So the next, the next thing I wanted to look at is how you actually go about the process of doing these things. How do you achieve kind of better media coverage or even just some media coverage? So one of the critical things that I've been trying to beat into my, to my team for, for ever since we were launched is that getting coverage is not just the responsibility of the communications team. You, you can't rely purely on a communications team to, to, to achieve these things for you. It's a team effort. While, while those of us who work in communications might well be the sort of front end of this, actually reaching directly out to people and um, doing what you might regard as the sales job, we can only sell a decent product. Um, and it's the entire team's responsibility to both create and service that decent product. So every single person involved in the process of producing materials for any media-facing organisation should recognise their own part in this and work, that, and work hard to play it. And to my mind, the first critical role of a media team or of a communications team is actually to oversee the creation of great products that are going to work well with the media by working directly with the rest of the team, with the academic team, with the, with the, with the, with the, with the subject experts. And this means that, I mean, that the development of any piece of work that has value for the public needs, needs, is built with the potential for outreach built into it right from the very beginning. Researchers really need to think about the story behind their research. What is that story? Who needs to hear it? What do these people need to do when they hear it? Um, and then work with the communications team to create a product, whether that's a report, a press release, a press conference, a meeting with politicians, or even just a one-off comment to the media that's going to make sure that the right story is told to the right people, told to pe so people who need to hear it, and that those people do actually clearly understand what to do about it afterwards. Now, I mean, often I would say straight reports, straight press releases, they, they can be enough. You know, they can sometimes be enough to get you a brilliant result. Um, but sometimes you also need to be a bit creative about what you're doing as well. I mean, I've got a Trojan horse down here. This is my creativity stroke sneakiness version of things. Um, what, what I perceive to be Trojan horses are the things that mean that you can repackage what's a, a story that may not actually reach the media. Sometimes, because sometimes interesting stories are boring. I mean, this is a challenge. Um, so to find something within your work that allows you to, to put a front end onto your important story, which means it will actually get picked up and run by the media. I'll just give you an example of something that we did, which is a kind of a Trojan horse style story. So we did a we did a review. We did a, a, a review of the of migration in the sense of the, the 2011 census, what the sort of changes to the UK's migrant populations were at a local and regional level. And most places around the country were very excited and interested in this because they, you, know, you could find out about how your local area had changed and all this kind of stuff. But the places where nothing much happened obviously didn't really want to run these stories. But it was still important for them to be engaged with this because at the end of the day, the people who are living there need to be in a position where they can make informed decisions based on real facts about their area as well as about the national level issue. And so the southwest was an area which wasn't of great interest. Nobody, re nothing much happened there. It changed, you know, the migrant population rose, but it rose less than most, most other areas. And it, yes, it wasn't kind of at the bottom. It was kind of all in the middle and not that exciting. And so I was kind of looking for a way that we could get this kind of thing into the, into the, into the local press. And actually, one of the things that we spotted was that one local authority in, in, in the southwest, which was Purbeck in Dorset, um, was the only area in the entire country where the share of the migrant population had actually decreased over the 10 years between 2001 and 2011. And this, because you've got a one single sort of interesting outlier there, that obviously became something which people got terribly excited about. And that created a situation where that data point was something that they all wanted to run. But actually, at the end of the day, they couldn't just run it in isolation. So it had to be run with the context of the entire area. So it created a situation where not only did the local press, but actually the national press all picked up on it as well. And it, and it turned Purbeck into an interesting... Well, actually, Purbeck's a lovely place, but it became interesting from a migration point of view for a brief period of time. And so what I was going to say is that when you look at your data, look at it and consider what are the things in there that might make some bloke in the pub look up from his beer and go, really? Because that's what a news story is. And that's what news organisations want to run, because that's what sells media content. But then there's another thing, which is, and this is, I think, the most important thing for all of you guys to remember, which is that 
basically everything you do is amazing. You may not realise it, but everything you do is brilliant and amazing, and the media desperately needs it. So it's really vital to understand just how important the role that you play is and how much the press does actually need you. I mean, when the Migration Observatory was launched four years ago, our offer of an independent voice on migration issues was absolutely snapped up. I mean, people were biting our hands off for it. I mean, a lot of people were questioning whether it was possible to have an independent voice on this. Um, but, I mean, we immediately, I mean, on the day of our launch, our extremely nervous director ended up on the Today programme on Radio 4 trying to explain what we were trying to do. Um, and since then, I mean, I don't think we've had a moment, a day where I haven't received at least 10 calls from the press about various different bits and pieces. But the point is that journalists aren't experts. They don't know and they usually don't pretend to know the details of any issue so they need experts like the migration observatory or like Cochrane to give their stories authority now again I, I don't want to talk much about Cochrane because it's not my area of expertise but one of the things that I did do when I was preparing for this talk was have a chat with a few people who are involved with Cochrane in various ways in sort of from a media perspective one of whom was Fiona, was Fiona Fox who's the chief executive of the uh, of the science media center and the quote on the board I'm going to read this out loud I'm sorry if it's, if it's tedious for you to see and have it read to you at the same time this is what she said she said when we were first set up 12 years ago I didn't have a medical background and I'd never heard of Cochrane but I quickly realized that they were a big deal a gold standard, a badge of quality and reproducibility for clinical trials. And that's huge, because journalists are crying out for this stuff. They desperately need credible, trusted voices and materials, rather than stuff that might be interesting, but it's driven by an agenda, or it's only been shown to work on mice. And she went on to say that she believed that Cochrane could play a much bigger role in public debate on issues, and to have, and that, and that to have Cochrane researchers available and participating in public debate more would have a hugely positive impact on the quality of media discourse around health issues in the UK. But again, I mean, this is about more than just whether your comms team is able to place a story brilliantly. It's about the whole of an organisation realising what it's got to offer public debate and then everyone playing their role in getting it out there. It means understanding who you're talking to and using appropriate ways of communicating with them. Um, and now, obviously, a decent outreach strategy is also going to build up, going to build in things like enough time to prepare reports properly and uh, to and make sure that you've got decent press materials to make sure that people who know about the issue are actually going to be available to talk to press at the right time and to make sure that senior staff actually know what you're going to do and have agreed to it. And then we've got a final critical issue to remember, which is managing risk, because as soon as you engage with the press, you place yourself and place yourself in the public eye does expose you to risk. Um, and... So the first thing you need to do, I mean, so minimising risk is very important. And the first thing I think that you should do, and I'm sure that you guys all do this already, but I'm going to say it again because it's got to be heard, is that you, your reputation is everything. So check everything, check it again, check it a third time, all of your data, all of your stats. Get somebody else to check it. Once somebody else has checked it and you know that there's 100% perfect, perfect data in there, check it again because... <laughs> Um, because it, your, your reputation is built on it. I'm sure you guys don't need me to say that, but it's very, very important. And the amount of times that we've come to the day before we're going to do something and realise that actually there's something in there that's slightly anomalous or dubious is... Um, is but, but, yeah, anyway, so checking things. The next thing to do is to try and get yourself inside the minds of journalists and think about what you're presenting. Think about, is there any way that somebody who can get a great headline out of something can misrepresent what you're doing? Um, accidentally or deliberately, because if you can see a way that somebody can do that, then there's a likelihood that somebody will do that. So try and avoid that kind of thing happening by just thinking it through. Be, be a journalist. But then I would also say that even if you do all of those things, it's impossible to avoid risk completely. And so I've got some pointers for minimising the fallout if you do get attacked by the press. And the first thing is do it kind of politely. Correct errors, correct errors that have been made in anything, but do it in a way which is polite, succinct, but in full, and do it discreetly. Do it on your website and then tweet stuff about it rather than, set, rather than sending angry letters to a newspaper and going, how dare you do this, unless it's a catastrophe, in which case kind of other rules probably apply. But re generally speaking, when, when mistakes are made, when people do things that are wrong, don't start a fight with them. Because if you, if you start a fight with a company that buys ink by the barrel, you're going to lose. Um... The other thing is don't try and create a caucus of people who support you and attack them or anything like that. Don't, don't try and get opposing media organisations to say these guys were terrible. Just, just use gentle means. Use social media. Use Twitter. Publish things on your website. Make sure that your corrections are, are, make sure you create your corrections are placed in a, in a source where, which isn't 
filtered by another media organization. And then, and this is the most important thing, move on and don't worry about it. And the reason that you've got this Diana Fun hijacked by the left front page of the Daily Mail is because that's the one serious attack that we've ever encountered. That the, the hijacked by the left, we were funded by the Diana Fund, and the Daily Mail was keen to attack the Diana Fund. And so they decided to write a story which was suggesting that they'd been hijacked by a, a sort of left-wing conspiracy that was determined to flood the UK with immigrants, which was not true. Um, or at least certainly in our case, I don't know what their other funding, what the, what the other things they were funding were, were, were doing. But so we were extremely angry, obviously, because we, we were being portrayed on the front page of a national newspaper in an extremely negative light. Um, and we, all, we obviously wanted to kind of correct everything, but, but we followed the procedure that I basically described here, even though we'd been on the front page being attacked very viciously. And obviously, you have a load of Twitter fallout from this as well. Lots of people saying, you guys are terrible. Why do you want to... And you, and you ha but by not taking the fight to them, by not trying to create a situation where you say, you guys are wrong and proving your point to these people who absolutely have no interest in correcting their story, you do better. And I would say that by going through the process that we've described here, and also by producing materials which the Daily Mail then wanted <laughs> soon afterwards, we, we, we've put ourselves in a situation where now, instead of being accused of being a bunch of terrible lefties, which is what we were two years ago, the Daily Mail now repeatedly describes us as being respected and independent. Now, that's a much better situation to be in than to be that organisation that fought them, that they want to take down because they were aggressive and unpleasant. So I, I think that's important. Um, now, I've got, I'll, I'll just whiz through a few, Julie was talking about impact earlier on, I, 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 let me just quickly go through a few things. I mean, the first thing is that impact actually means different things in different situations, but most of us are expected to deliver it somehow or another. Now, from the point of view of the ref, this means provide, proving risk and significance. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of you work in, work in organisations that require, that, that, or for institutions that are involved with the ref in one way or another. And this reach and significance question is something that media can help you with. It can't really do that much about the significance of your work, but it can do a hell of a lot about the reach. And actually, I mean, in terms of significance, if, you, if your reach goes far enough and, and if policies change as a result of what you've said, then you've got significance there as well. So take that seriously. I mean, the media can play a big role in your funding, you know. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, yeah, and actually, I mean, in the long term, this can create a situation where policies are more likely to be developed based on rational analysis and solid, ev solid evidence. Um, and that, that's good. Um, sorry. <laughs> Getting a bit, getting a bit lost. But yeah, I mean, it is. But impact is a slippery, con, a slippery concept. I mean, research councils and other organ, and other funders may well also define impact in other ways. But it's very rare that you're going to be in a situation where good media coverage isn't going to enhance the impact of what you've done. I mean, as Julie pointed out, I mean, I, I'm, I apologise about speculating on, uh, for speculating about this, but I'm sure that for most of you, impact really means positive outcomes for, 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 for patients. Um, but again, I mean, if you bring about changes to things through a process of pushing things harder and people taking notice of what you've got to say, then you can make that happen too. Um, and then finally, working with the media, just a few key points. The first is this, truth is a malleable concept. It, it, people don't like to accept that, but it is. The media needs experts like you because otherwise truth gets framed in ways that can be problematic. So it's important to participate the second is that it's a team effort. It really has to be a team effort at all times. It's not just the communications team's job. So work with them and create products together that are going to make you, that are going to create this impact. The third point, which I think I made fairly, con 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 yeah, fairly convincingly, I hope anyway, is that the media is commercial. You know, if you're going to reach the media, if you want people to do things, it's not just because what you do is good. It's because it's going to help them to sell their product. Now, I mean, that's a challenge, but it means that you've got to think about their commercial motivations and develop content that's going to speak to their audience in one way or another. And that's an important thing to do. And then finally, while the, pre while the press can quite often be a sizable pain in the arse and it can cre quite often create more problems than it, than it, than it, than it solves... Journalists get things wrong. They can be aggressive. Um, th there are all kinds of reasons why the press is a problem, and I, I really wouldn't wouldn't try to tell you anything else. But and this is the really important bit: it's an ally that you need. For all of its sins, the press is critical. 
it matters because it's about it's how people inform themselves about things. It's, it's how people inform themselves about migration. It's how most people, probably doctors aside, inform themselves about medicine issue, medical issues. It's how people inform themselves about football, about Kim Kardashian. I mean, and th at the end of the day, it can change the world for the better. You, it, but but only if you work with it. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I've gone on a bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Rob, thanks. Th thanks very much. That, down that's, down there, down there. Yes, have a seat there, and we'll find some questions out. That, that's, that's very thought-provoking. I think it's a great way to, to end, because it's drawn several of the things together that we've been talking about. Are there any, just, 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 for, just a couple of, two or three questions before we all wend our way home? Anybody? Yeah, uh, yes, so, Ian, there, there's, a, there's a microphone on its way to you. And then we'll come to um, you next. Thanks, uh, Ian Chimel, Economics Methods Group. Um, uh, thanks for a, a great talk there. Um, you know, I, I agreed with, and there was, you know, nuggets in there. I agreed with lots of what was there. Um, but the only thing that I'd sort of take issue on, which I think was a sort of contradiction in a way, is that like if we accept that like what we, uh, you know, when we observe nature, we never really observe nature. We only observe our uh, methods of, uh, you know, nature subjected to our methods of mm. questioning and the results of that, and and. Uh, if you think about uh, um, there being no such thing as truth or falsity, only more or less interesting ways of conceptualising the world, then do we really need truth here? Because that sets up a sort of opposition uh, and a dichotomy between uh, truth and falsity, which doesn't really isn't really consistent with all the great messages that you talked about how to deal with it. I, so I, comments on that. I wasn't trying to suggest that there's no such thing as truth. What I was trying no, to I'm suggest... Sorry, I'm suggesting that there's no such thing as truth. Right. <laughs> ah, okay. um, to clarify. I'm suggesting well, that it's not a helpful concept to help frame this. Right, OK. But in, in, the, in, the, in the context of media and how you receive information from newspapers and what have you, you expect them to tell you the truth, or at least something that they, can, that they perceive to be the truth, and something which, is gonna, which, isn't, which isn't misleading you deliberately, yeah? Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the thing is that, I mean, I would argue that something which isn't deliberately misleading you fits into all kinds of different confusing kind of areas. And that the, the Calais stuff was designed to try to illustrate that a little bit. I mean, at the end of the day, those stories were all accurate representations of something. And the problem is that they leave out a lot of stuff. And I mean, I suppose this is kind of the point that you're making. It's a sort of, it's a complicated, nebulous, messy kind of area. Maybe truth isn't the right way of framing it here, but I think that at the end of the day, doing things that, pro providing information which gives people the, the ability to critically assess what, it, what they perceive to be the rights or wrongs of a situation is really, really important. And I think that when you, when you deny people access to some of the elements of that, then that's a problem. And that's kind of what I was trying to get at. I don't know if that even gets anywhere close to answering your question. I think this is, a, this is, this, this is one that needs, a, that needs about six pints of beer to really resolve properly. Well, I'm, I'm up for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was about to say, Ian would be up for that. Yeah, very, so, Alan. Th thanks for that talk, which was um, very interesting. Um, I'm Alan Smith from the Where, uh, uh, there you are, Cochrane <laughs> Cystic Fibrosis and Genetic Disorders Group. And the message I'm going to take away from this meeting is that I should get involved in social media, and yet I regard social media with deep suspicion, particularly Twitter, because mm. I think it's the domain of the... Uh, and this is not an offence to anyone. I don't mean to give offence to anyone who habitually uses Twitter, but you gave an example of Katie Hopkins. Oh, I God, think. yeah. So, you know, to me, it's the demand of the... But, but you, have a choice about, you have a choice about how you use these, 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 these methods. And we, we use Twitter a lot, actually. But we don't get involved. We don't have discussions with people on Twitter. And I don't see... I mean, I actually am the person who writes the tweets, generally speaking. But what I write is things like, we've done a new piece of analysis on X or Y, link, click... Uh, or something which says, oh, such and such has been discussed, here's an interesting piece of research which informs it, click. Or sometimes, such and such is fundamentally wrong, here's, some, here's the evidence that shows you that, click. Yeah. You don't need to engage in Twitter. The idea, people will tell you, oh, the only way that you can use Twitter is if you're terribly informal and you sit there kind of using words like rad when you're wrong, or whatever it's, I don't know what it is, I'm sorry, I'm old. <laughs> but, but, and that's not the case. You can, get, you can use social media in very, in very discreet, very sensible ways. 
and I think that it's. I think that your, you know, your choice about how you engage with it is is yours. It's not something. There isn't a kind of method where you have to use it. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's no different to to sending an email to somebody. You know, you don't send an email. You know, you don't just because you can send a picture of your dog kind of doing an amusing dance. You know, doesn't mean that you have to do it. You know. So, so you've given us some advice about how to deal with the conventional press. Mm. So would your advice about social media or say Twitter be use it as a way of getting out single, discreet, clear, important messages, but don't get involved in the conversation? Is that is that I, I think if you get, and I think you, you should warn you before you answer that we've had someone giving the opposite view really? already this morning. Really? really? Well there you go. I mean and but this is the thing. I mean there's a you you have a choice about how you engage with it. And I'm not I wouldn't say don't do that, but I would say that you expose yourself to right, the, the informal nature of any of these social media platforms is such that people want you to have a conversation with them. And so having a conversation with them is great if you're happy to have that conversation with them and if you're sure that you can exit that conversation in straightforward terms. I work on the issue of immigration. If I have conversations with everybody who wants to talk about immigration, I can promise you a lot of them are going to get out of hand very quickly. Um, so you have to make a decision based on what it is that you're talking about and how it is that you want to engage with people. Um, there are an awful lot of people that I work with or sort of colleagues at other universities who use Twitter a lot and who are extremely vocal and who do have those fights and those arguments. And some of them are highly respected um, and remain highly respected despite the arguments and fights they've had with people on Twitter about stuff because they're happy to stand by a position, justify it, show the evidence here and there and da da, da. But, I mean... I, th I, 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 I sometimes try to explain uh, uh, kind of the challenge of engaging with people in the wrong way, whether it's through the conventional media or Twitter or whatever, in the context of if you, if you, have, if you play chess against somebody who's boxing, you'll lose, you know? Um, so, <laughs> so because the punch in the face, regardless of how brilliant your moves may be, will leave you lying flat on the floor. <laughs> so... so <laughs> So that's the question. If you can, if you can engage with people, whether it's through the, I mean, whether it's through the press, whether it's through, whether it's through social media or whatever, in a way which means that you know that you're playing the same game, and that you can actually, and that you can come out of it with either a potential stalemate or or, or a checkmate, then that's fine. But if you know that you're in a situation where nothing you can do is going to take away is going to take away from the fact that you're just going to get a lot somebody writing this guy's a whatever in caps afterwards, then what, why would you bother doing that? I'm, I'm going to stop there. Actually, I'm going to suggest that I think, I think if there are any more questions, I'm sure Rob will be around for a little bit. After. I don't know what time your plane is, but My anyway, not, whatever. Uh, not and I'm just going to turn the floor over to, to Donal now for the final brief word uh, uh, to sort of close, this, uh, close the day and the meeting. Okay. Well, I uh, just want to, to thank everybody for, for coming along. And uh, I think Martin has asked me if uh, we would just uh, put our hands together for all of the team from uh, the UK Cochrane Centre who have uh, worked so hard uh, both here but for the previous months uh, lining up a really great uh, group of speakers and organising uh, all the details in order for us to have a wonderful couple of days. So can we do that? <laughs> We drag them all up and make them take a bow up front, but Martin said he'll uh, he'll keep something uh, nice and more uh, intimate back in the centre when they show up at six o'clock on Monday morning for <laughs> work as usual. Um, but uh, on uh, on behalf of Cochrane Ireland, I would just like uh, to thank all of you for for coming over or for coming along um, from uh, from parts of Ireland or, or over from the UK. Um, I'm really glad we were able to show you a little bit of what the weather can be like over here. We, uh, we schedule one of those days at least once a year or every other year. Um, but uh, um, I'd just like to, to conclude um, to just give you a, an Irish greeting. Slán gafol agus gnarian boherlat. Um, so just uh, may the, as, as they say in English, may the, may the road rise up to, to greet you and may you be in, um, in heaven half an hour before the devil knows you de you're dead. Um, but uh, I wish you all safe home, whether you're driving, training or flying, and uh, look forward to seeing you at, at future Cochrane events. So thank you. Thank you.